uh, let us know. Uh, Tawana is out of town. Talisha can't come tonight. I'm not sure if Dr. Keisha will be here. So if you want she to, just, um, oh, Daniel saying sure. Okay, perfect. Okay, Anybody else who wants to come up, feel free. Absolutely. Yeah, Dr. Feel K just free said to that she come up on the panel. Bob Barker said, "Come on down." <laughs> come on up. Come on down. <laughs> So um, while we are waiting for more people to come in, I want to say hello and good evening to everybody. Oh, he's in a suit and every, oh my goodness, yeah, yeah. he's like GQ'd up. <laughs> yep, busy, busy. Hey, man. Oh, yes. <laughs> he, looks, he, he looks like he's about ready to either go to the airport for a business trip or a magazine cover. I don't know. That's right. <laughs> no, it's just busy with conference meetings um so you know i have my uh, uh own company i was uh telling you all about mm -hmm. health uh, blockchain security services and so mm -hmm. just uh having some meetings with a few so we ha have some developers actually they they're developing the security analytics uh software application yeah yeah so Very the cool. business we're concentrating on uh, smart contract transactions and particularly the vulnerabilities actually of the uh, smart contracts i don't know if you all had remember this article came out i think it was about a couple weeks ago mm -hmm. where uh DeFi or DiFi particularly had some issues with their smart contracts as far as illegal transactions is concerned mm -hmm. so that is actually what our two will be doing is we actually building uh, predictive models you know you utilize the machine learning to be able to kind of track the illegal transactions through tracking the history and then trying to find the, you know, understand how often these legal transactions are being transacted across the uh, blockchain network and kind of create this actionable insights or, 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 or dashboard view to, mm -hmm. to kind of like guide them and help them understand that, hey, um, build this prediction. Like if they had legal transaction, let's say for instance, in the past, during a period of time from January to February, and it's it's a pattern. Basically, you can pretty much predict going into next year, hey, during these particular months, you mm -hmm. might, as a business, you might wanna concentrate and focus on um, this is a period of time where you, you, you start to have your illegal transactions. So you might wanna make sure your developers are, you know, as far as the coding is concerned, um, sure if these misconfigurations and et cetera. So, that is kind of one of the focus, kind of sort of like a real time monitoring and or building this predictor model and, and trying to see how how this predictor model will work with uh, tracking illegal okay. transactions. Yep. Well, that's I mean, I'm, I'm listening to you. I'm also trying to find us on uh, Facebook, but I'm not able to tonight. So uh, <laughs> that's OK, because I see some people are liking the video and commenting and things like that in Facebook, but I can't seem to find us. So that is that is great. So mm -hmm. um, I think that, you know, having somebody like you come and talk about the business that you're creating and yes. some of the things mm -hmm. that you're discovering, who your target market would be for products yep. and uh, a service like that. Absolutely. And then some of the other uh, lines of business, you mm -hmm. know, that so, people, as, go ahead. I'm sorry. No, I was going to say, so absolutely. So the target market basically really is the fine tech market, right? So, or fine tech, tech sector. Um, you mean, you mean FinTech? Really you mean financial term. services? So yes. Yes. Okay. Businesses who are pretty much utilizing, you know, the blockchain ecosystem. Mm -hmm. And so that's kind of pretty much our target market now. Okay. And also, you know, if you've been tracking, there's an average of 670,000 smart contracts being transacted. Um, a, a company called, uh, it was a website, Coin Telegraph, mm -hmm. um, indicated like around the end of 2019, on an average 670,000 uh, smart contracts that's being transacted on the Ethereum um, um, public network or permissionless network. So that is our focus for now. Um, of course, we have, and as you mentioned, the competition. There's some other companies, organizations, uh, competition that that and Blockwatch. Uh, Dr. Keisha had forwarded that to me, and it's kind of similar to them. Um, however, the difference, Blockwatch, pretty much they kind of 
transact or, or kind of record or monitor in real time the history of the blockchain trans or the blockchain network transaction itself. Mm -hmm. um, they don't do the predictive piece of it like you do. Not real. They not and, and and again they don't. What I didn't see. Um, and, I, and, and again, they could be calling, um, if you look at their site, they, they call it block, they, they track the history of the blockchain network itself. However, of course, mm -hmm. that blockchain network is immutable. Um, but again, as we all know, I mean, you have some you know, security issues with that, right? 51% attack, right? Um, if you get a miner that can, as far as its computational power is concerned, can, can and, and or group, can take control over 51% of that network, it's pretty much compromised, right? So right. Um, Blockwatch really focuses on that. Um, we're specializing in smart contract transactions, right? And, and the vulnerabilities and issues with the smart contract as it's being transacted on the network itself. Blockwatch, what they do, they, in which we will eventually, but Blockwatch, they do, you know, uh, all the platforms of the blockchain technology as far as the blockchain network transaction is concerned. So I didn't see yet as far as smart contracts that they really focus on that. So to distinguish us from them, that's kind of like I say to a lot of people is my business, we, we call it sort of like Simba, we call it security analytics as a service because it's in the cloud, right? So that's kind of like that market we're, you, we, we're using, or our term that we're using, security analytics as a service, they're not too, there's not many companies doing that right now. Right, and I mean, you could be the number one company for that, so definitely, definitely, definitely I love it. Good evening, Richard, how are you? And don't forget to unmute yourself. <laughs> Good evening. Good evening. Good evening, Richard. Hey, Richard. How, how are you doing? Hey, very well, very well, very well. Just coming in from, from work not too long ago. <laughs> and um, glad to be aboard. Um, yeah, Daniel, that's some great things that you're working on uh, with yeah. regards to the, the companies and such and smart contracts. Um, I'm looking to soak up everything and, and um, be a part of the whole organization, be able to add some value to everybody and the organization. Absolutely. Yes, yeah. yes. Yeah. yeah, I mean, I definitely can see Daniel. I've been, obviously, we've been um, focused a lot on the 10K project. And one of the yeah. things I'm continuously talking about are these teams that need to be mm -hmm. built and these super teams. And, right. you know, if we're going to create uh, multi-million dollar and billion dollar organizations kind of having yes. us come together and, and do that. And I know within BBC, there are groups of people that have gotten together to create businesses. So yes. uh, some of them I know about, others I may not. I'd like to know about them all just so I can know you know what's happening overall yeah. but um, oh, yeah I'm yeah. so proud of, of, of everybody who are oh, creating yes. teams and yep. then figuring out how to you know market how to sell how to operate and how to get your piece of the pie so exactly. I'm, I'm very uh, happy and impressed with with everyone Yes, absolutely, yeah. totally. Agree. Especially that Simba Chain group. So I did see Dr. Keisha in here. I'm, I'm hoping she comes back in. But we can get started with uh, the topic of the evening. So I'm going to start off with saying, you know, if it's Wednesday, it's Blockchain Day. So welcome to Blockchain Chat, uh, everybody. We've actually chatting uh, has already started. So I'm Cherie. I am the founder of BBC. And here we're all about the business of blockchain. So we want to welcome everyone who is new. What does business of blockchain mean? That is, means if you are considering a blockchain job, you want a blockchain based business, you want to invest in the blockchain, whether you're investing time or money into a project. And ultimately, this is going to be a $3.1 trillion industry. We want our piece of it. Uh, if you are care about any of that, then you are in the right place. So we have a ton of courses that people can take. You can become a member. We have our LinkedIn course. Daniel did the, um, the crypto economics course. We have uh, our, our smart contracts course. Uh, with membership, you can in get involved with 
people that are working on government contracts, working on smart contracts with Simba Chain. We have other things that are coming down the pipeline. So uh, it's blockchainstudies.tech if you want to find our website, blockchainstudies.tech. We also have our Bitcoin challenge. So real news uh, for the month of july we are going to give away twenty dollars worth of bitcoin to the person who um, takes a before snapshot of your linkedin take the linkedin course uh, change the information on your linkedin profile based on what you learn and then take an after snapshot um, and send it to me at info at blackblockchainconsultants.com. What will happen is we will look at the most improved blockchain infused profile and whomever wins will get uh, $20 worth of Bitcoin. So you have until next Friday to get all of that done and send me your entry next Friday around 5 p.m. Eastern time is when we are going to be looking at who uh, the winner will be. The final thing I'll say is February 19th and 20th of 2021, we will be in Los Angeles, God willing, provided that the COVID and all of that is uh, taken care of and, and behind us and we can safely travel at that time. We're not selling tickets right now or anything like that. We're just asking you to hold the date. If you're interested in you know, 20, 25, 30 people max getting together, we're going to, uh, Eric is working on, on us um, digitizing a piece of art and doing tokenization, a live tokenization of a piece of black art. We're going to do something around Simba Chain and smart contracts and actually creating that. And we're also going to talk about the business of blockchain, um, the future of blockchain and how we can uh, you know, um, get more involved with, with blockchain as black people. So February 19th and 20th of 2021, Los Angeles, just put it on your calendar and we'll let everyone know in the fall, um, based on, we'll know, <laughs> we'll know if we're going to definitely have it or not. So, um, I don't have any other announcements, Eric. Introduce yourself, and if there are any announcements you have, you can feel free to tell us. Um, not too much after that. Well, Eric Spence, I am uh, president of Blockchain Consortium International, um, lover of uh, tokenization of assets and the application of blockchain technology into that sector. I just believe it's going to completely allow us to do things that we never even dreamed of being able to, being able to do previously. Um, and this too, and this, I, I just want to say this is really an exciting time. Um, buckle your chin strap up because 2020 is about to be a wild ride. I just got it to, already just got is a wild ride. ride. <laughs> <Yeah>. <laughs> we're not done yet. So we are I, not even done. No, yeah. we're, we're halfway done. Uh -huh. <laughs> exactly. Yeah. That's for sure. <laughs> so Richard, did you want to introduce yourself, what you've been working on in the blockchain space? Oh, yeah, I'm glad you said that. I, I realized that I didn't introduce myself, Richard Davis. Um, fairly new, fairly more of an active member, I should, I should say. I just signed up with the Simba chain and looking to learn how to uh, write smart contracts. I'm actually spreading the word throughout, throughout my contacts as a, as a natural recruiter. That's what I do for a living right now. Cool. And um, build up some, um, some connections that I have in the, in the legal industry and also in the um, crypto in the trading industry so i do trade and invest but i know the whole game is about the technology itself blockchain technology and it actually helps um to learn more about um, blockchain technology so you can pick better um coins and tokens <laughs> to, to invest yeah. and i actually connected with my old coach trade uh, my old trading coach and we're going to be working on some things behind the scenes that connected with um, a, an attorney because I think um, merging is, merges and acquisition is going to be big with regards to um, small contracts and what's happening um, globally between now and next year. So, um, Daniel, we, we'll be talking. on that. So, so what are you seeing in the market with, with mergers and acquisitions? Tell us a little oh, bit more about that. Yeah. 
Now, a um, little bit of history about myself. Um, I spent about 21 and a half years, I know I look, I still look young, <laughs> it's uh, one of the top corporate law firms called Scanner Arts, and I was a corporate um, paralegal. So their bread and butter was mergers and acquisitions. So I saw um, what was happening from the early, say like um, mid to early 90s, okay. mid to 90s, how things were changing. And all the documentation, whether it's private or governmental, dealing with the SEC, mm -hmm. um, that all that documentation needs security and, and transparency. And also um, in a timely fashion when, when funds need to be released and, and but conditions have to be met, you know, so that they can be released too also. And there's, there's a lot, especially over, I think a couple of crashes that I've been through in working with um, um, with Skadden Arps and a lot of mergers and acquisitions I've seen behind the scenes. A lot of things happen over the weekends that it would move the markets. <laughs> mm -hmm. so, oh, I'm yeah. sure. I'm sure. Yeah. So yeah. Yeah. I've never worked in uh, M&A specifically, but I know that with any kind of acquisition, there's always mm -hmm. a lot of stuff in the air. And I had a friend who was selling a company and, you know, he comes in and he says, it's all in the hands of the lawyers now. <laughs> you know? So I'm like, how do you, you know, how do you feel? You know, isn't that great? And he's like, oh, it's all in the hands of the lawyers now. So, <laughs> so yes, but what you're saying with regards to, I, it, it never occurred to me uh, to even think about M&A with regards to, um, to blockchain, but I can definitely see how uh, it would correlate, you know, with regards to um, lawyers now, they, they have to make so much, they make so much money because they have to dot every I, cross every T, things like that. And if we were able to standardize a lot of the information or, or have the history of the organization where you didn't have to do all the audits and things like that, um, mm -hmm. it could hopefully reduce some of those costs um, for, uh, for the businesses. So yeah, some of those legal fees. So yeah. interesting, very interesting. Well, definitely keep us up to date with that. And, you know, I, I love the whole blockchain law and blockchain finance space. So if you, you know, want to be a thought leader and a pioneer in that, we look forward to it. Absolutely. Yeah. All right. Well, let's uh, talk a little bit about, um, blockchain smartphones. So we have a few articles, y'all know I'm famous for my articles, and I draw some information and everyone responds. So including everyone in the chat. So you'll let us know what you're thinking here. So can everyone see my screen? Yep. Okay then, so before we talk, so there was some news this week about Stellar foundation doing a deal with Samsung and their um, smartphone, uh, blockchain smartphone app store. But before we do that, some of you may not even realize that there are blockchain phones. So what I wanted to do was have an article here that explained what this is and why it's significant. So that's why I have, you know, why the HE double hockey sticks <laughs> is a blockchain phone and do I need one? Um, and basically what they're saying here is that, uh, devices, you know, in order to be decentralized or in order to have Web 3.0, uh, you're going to have to be able to uh, have a way for the, um, a way for people to be able to manage their private keys. So that's one of the big things that we learned when we got started and when blockchain was the wild, wild west or crypto, more importantly, was the wild, wild west. And it still is in a way is you can't have mass adoption unless people are able to retrieve their uh, private keys because Bitcoin doesn't have 1-800-BITCOIN, let me reset my password. And, you know, uh, some of the diehard people have even lost Bitcoin into, you know, the Neverland region 
Or, you know, um, I heard a story of a guy who died and his family, and he had Bitcoin and his family couldn't get into his computer because they didn't have the key. And they lost all of that wealth, just like that. So um, these blockchain smartphones are meant to help with that. So uh, in the wildest dreams of enthusiasts, these devices will be a gateway to something called the decentralized web or web 3.0. In this future version of the internet, blockchain and similar technologies would support decentralized apps that look and feel like the mobile apps we use today, but run on public peer-to-peer -peer networks instead of the private servers of big tech companies. It's widely thought that a major impediment to mainstream adoption of cryptocurrency and dApps uh, is that these technologies are too difficult to use for people who are not tech savvy. But getting there is not straightforward, given that the key is paramount. You lose your keys and you lose your assets. One particular feature of the HTC Exodus One, which is a version of this uh, blockchain smartphone, is called social key recovery. Users can choose a small group of contacts and give them parts of their keys. If they lose their keys, they can recover them piece by piece from their contacts. So this is one of the ways, this is one of the ways that people um, can protect their keys, but also have a way of recovering their keys. Now, my first question is, and I'm looking forward to hearing from the panel and from everyone else in, in the, um, the chat here, what if I have a falling out with the person that has part of my key you know, and, and I lose my key and now I have to reach out to this person I don't like. What wow. if they die? You know, what if um, for whatever reason I can't get in touch with them because they're in Antarctica and I really need my keys because my money is attached to this, et cetera. So uh, yes, I threw the monkey wrench in there. I, I, as you can tell, I just see a lot of holes with this, but I, I like the ingenuity of it. I just think that there are a lot of holes with the solution. Um, I'll open it up. You know, let me just say one thing about this. Um, I was listening to a live stream uh, last night. It was with CZ, um, who's the CEO of Binance, mm -hmm. which if you don't know, it, for anyone out here who's, who's not aware, Binance is one of the largest um, crypto exchanges. Um, in, CZ was saying that, you know, from his vantage point, a lot of people really do not want to be um, completely responsible for holding and securing all of their crypto assets. Mm -hmm. Now, of course, he was talking about, you know, at that point, because someone brought up, hey, you know, because sometimes people leave their assets on the exchange. Um, I would say, you know, never to do that. Um, you know, you should uh, have your assets stored on either Square Wallet, Ledger, Trezor, whatever the case would be. There's actually many now that are out. Um, but, you know, he was saying that a lot of people don't want to, as, you know, the moniker has always been of being their own bank. A lot of people don't want to be their own bank. They don't want to have that responsibility. And, you know, for a lot of the times, it's, it's, it's because of those things. If, if you have your private key and you lose your private key, and you don't have it memorized and you have it written down and for whatever reason your house burns down there's a fire mm -hmm. or something like that there's no one else you're going to go to for any kind of recourse um if bank of america burns down or something like that if the branch burns down i can still get my sure. <laughs> yeah like you, you're okay so you know there is that bridge from the traditional world and the thought process behind what we're used to when mm -hmm. it comes down to being the custodian of all of our assets and, and you being the completely the person who's totally responsible. Um, it sounds, you know, it sounds great. Um, I love it. I believe in it. But for wider mass adoption, um, some people just don't want to do that. They just want to say, hey, you know what? I'd rather just buy it, hold it, and to have someone else hold it just in case 
you know, anything were to happen or something like that. So um, I do see these sort of bridges that are taking place where there is a thought process of understanding, okay, well, how do we have wider adoption for, you know, having these sort of things like the um, tree, those are all very valid points of, you know, if, if people like, like, you know, I know like the Winklevoss twins, I heard that for them, for their Bitcoin and them holding it in for their private keys, it's in safe deposit boxes across the country, are yeah, spread across around the, the globe, around the you globe. Yes. Yes. Yeah, they're not even in one country. In different banks. Yeah. <laughs> yeah. So, mm -hmm. you, you know, you think about something like that, but then, you know, and, and of course, you but know, then they, they have the resources to fly to all of those banks at a drop, at, you know, at a moment's notice too. So, exactly. yeah. So, so if you've got, um, you know, Keisha, <laughs> in Southside Chicago, then what does she do? Yeah. So that's it. Yes. Yeah. You, you know. Yeah. So 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 there are those things where um, there, you know, there becomes like this sort of hybrid approach that I think many times we've seen this, where it still is some semblance of um, the kind of you know the old world, I guess you would say, the older way mm -hmm. of doing things, the kind of the traditional way, but still also having the crypto innovation. Um, at the same time, too. So, um, mm -hmm. I, like I said, yeah, like all of those points that you brought up about, I mean, human relationships can become frail at times. People can get into fights, you know, things happen, their falling outs happen, all of that sort of thing. Um, sometimes over even trivial matters or that sort of stuff. Hey, I gave you my private key. You, it, it was only, you know, eight letters. Do you remember that? I think I do. What? <laughs> I threw it. Yeah, yeah. Like, wait, hey, do, you, do you remember that thing? Uh, oh, I threw it on a paper. I threw it out. Like, yeah. oh, what? Like, what do you do with stuff like that? So. Yes, yes. So, um, Daniel, Richard, I'm. Yeah. So, your thoughts. so, as as Eric uh, was just speaking and and to answer your question, Sheree. So. As Eric mentioned, a hybrid, right? So I was thinking about that hybrid mean the old world of centralization, right? And the balance of decentralization between those two. Okay, so in that in this case, um, I was just thinking about like a, a security storage management organization or a security key storage management organization where um, that's still that central element to it, right? A centralized element because you you having um, so one, like we all said, you know, you don't want to be your own bank. You know, you don't want to be handling all what comes to that the bank does, right? Mm -hmm. Everything, all your digital assets and everything. So um, you want someone that is sort of, that can help you, we as adults, help you be responsible for, I mean, from a financial perspective, because all what comes with it. So in my mind, I was thinking about a security storage or security key storage organization similar to what uh, Vitaly was speaking about a social key recovery type thing but then you also got to have this this organization who stores your keys for you but within that organization they themselves have to be compliant um, in, in regards to uh, financial regulations and etc so that if you Sheree like you mentioned someone that you do not want to communicate to your your keys with um that person cannot be able to communicate with you through your keys because you don't want them to through this security storage organization was in compliance and in regulation so uh from a security perspective that's why security and for blockchain and organizations who specialize in that will be huge, um, such as an organization like my HCISS, where you can, there's still this centralized element to it, mm -hmm. um, but you just got to balance it. And but it's I more secure. We, yeah. Yeah. And I think when we think about decentralization, um, that decentralization is still there. I remember um, when Rohan mentioned that the decentralization is just because you got different organizations have different systems. So blockchain enables you that decentralized, decentralized from that perspective of different systems, no matter which system you have, you can still be able to do your transactions, cryptocurrency through the blockchain network. So decentralization from that perspective. 
-hmm. But when you talk about security keys and et cetera, um, you got to start thinking about there's still a, the old world to it, which is still decentralization, but then you still got the decentralization and you just got to balance the two. Yeah. And Tangi is saying she doesn't want to be her own bank. It's too much responsibility and too much can go wrong. Roslyn is saying, reminds me of Brinks uh, when you were talking about the security. <laughs> uh, Tangi is saying, I think the company PolySign said they will be able to do custody of trillions of accounts and I would be comfortable with that. So yeah, I'm, I'm sure that there will be companies that yep agree to do that uh, for yep. people. So mm -hmm. definitely. Richard, your thoughts? Yeah, a number of thoughts came to mind from, from the individual man. Who do you trust? Who do you, and, exactly. and um, you know, do you trust somebody with your PIN number for your, for your ATM? That's, mm -hmm. that's the person you may want to go to. But then also, I thought about the legal aspect, you know, if you, if you have an attorney, maybe you want to have like a living will, you know, your private key is stored with your, with your attorney. And as you start to get into organizations, um, as, as Daniel was mentioning, now you, now you're getting it like semi decentralized, so to yeah. speak, you started, you know, you can't, it's almost, you can't get, get away with it. The more money you make and the more security more secure you want it and then you start going into organization so there, there's a there has to be a balance for for you personally because yep. it's supposed to be peer-to-peer -peer, you know security but then also when you start as this trillions and trillions of dollar business grows and grows you know organizations are going to pop up regulations are going to pop up exactly. you know probably going to have licensing and such you know, governmental, but at, at the end of the day, you know, um, what's more comfortable for the individual and or organization, you know, there has to be a balance there. Yeah. yeah. You know, yeah you I, mean, know, I don't you, even... You, you mind if I add one thing, Tree, to that? Sure. Just really quickly. You, you know, what I, you know, talk a lot, especially when it comes down to tokenization of assets, I talk about, we will see mass adoption when that becomes scaled down so that the, every person is able to use it and apply it you know, you know, applied into their lives. Let me just say, there are solutions, um, custodial solutions like Bitco is one. Um, mm -hmm. Celsius Lending does use Bitco to store all of their assets. Like I guess Celsius doesn't hold any of the assets. Uh, and, and anyone maybe not familiar, Celsius is a crypto lending platform. Now the thing is, Bitco, I, I believe they're uh, and and those assets are all insured up to a hundred million dollars, mm -hmm. but. I remember hearing Alex Mashinsky, the CEO of Celsius, talk about it. But the fee that Bitco charges, I think it's like fifty thousand dollars a month. Woo! So wow. Yes. Yeah, yeah, so you look at that, and who the the only person who could use that would be an institution. Mm -hmm. And that's why I talk about it scaled down. It's not scaled yeah. down. See, you know, for us as an everyday the regular user, person, yeah. yeah. But but imagine that if it was only fifteen dollars a month. Would mm -hmm. you do that if you had it, if your assets could be insured somewhere? Maybe, maybe not. Maybe, but um, I just think about those sort of things. So, um, yeah. Yeah. Mm -hmm. So earlier this year, Samsung uh, released the Galaxy S20, and that is its upgraded smartphone. And uh, within it, they included a new secure processing processor dedicated to protecting your PIN, password, pattern, and blockchain private key. So um, at the time of the launch, the wallet was only compatible with Ether and ER20 tokens, but Samsung added support for Bitcoin in September and Tron in October. Although initially exclusive to the S10 range, the company said in May that it wants to lower barriers and add cryptocurrency support for some of its more budget models. And then last month, or actually, I'm sorry, this month, last week, uh, Stellar Foundation started working with um, Samsung. So the Stellar Foundation is adding... Um, well, will add its blockchain ecosystem to Samsung's blockchain blockchain key store. So the foundation um, is integrating 
oh, sorry, this integration aims to provide a solution for Stellar end users to store private keys on selected Galaxy smartphones. Uh, Stellar's integration into Samsung blockchain key store is a significant step for our network and the incredible ecosystem of applications built on this platform. Samsung provides a key management solution that is user friendly and drives greater adoption of blockchain tech. With this integration, we've opened up to a new network of users that can benefit from the combined innovation of Stellar and Samsung. I kind of saw this as Apple Music and iPhone? Was it Apple Music and mm -hmm. iPhone? Oh, no. Um, well, initially, I think there were two different divisions, but I remember getting my new iPhone and getting, oh, no, never, the YouTube album. That was like automatically downloaded to people's um, iPhones, you know, uh, I don't know, about like five, six years ago now. And I like Bono, but I don't listen to you two. And I'm like, what in the world is this on my phone? How did these people get it? You know, my phone? Well, you know, and they had automatically launched it out. So I kind of see that Stellar's trying to do what um, Microsoft did and what Apple Music was trying to do in terms of getting in front of as many users as possible. And then Samsung is trying to uh, corner the market in terms of as many uh, blockchain apps um, and and systems as possible uh, and they're also trying to uh, help with mass adoption by by working on this uh, private key issue so um, I'm gonna open it up again uh, I have one more article but I, I'll open it up with these two things here that have been discussed you know, let me just say from a mass adoption standpoint, and you know, we often talk in, if you listen to the talk that we had with Rohan, Rohan mentioned um, that the UX was so important to mass adoption. And mm -hmm. you, you, you have to be honest, because you know, like we've talked about hardware wallets here. Um, and you know, once you're, you know, kind of been using them for a while, it's, it, you know, maybe not so, you know, um, complicated. But maybe for new users, it is it is a bit you know a little bit of a learning curve. But you have to think, starting off with the cell phones. Wow, I mean, you're talking about really making it much much easier for people to be able to hold crypto, secure the crypto, use the crypto straight from their straight from their cell phone. Um, I like it. Yeah. I do. I think it's very smart. Yeah, I, I totally agree with Eric. Um, it's just, the, again, you know, new users um, being able to navigate it and use it, right? Um, uh, it, it's a great idea. Um, but the thing I think about is, you know, again, you, you knew for these new users, you know, to the blockchain, you know, network and the wallets, it, it seems to be, it speaks to those that so what we just described earlier, you know, those who have been in the technology and using blockchain technology and, and digital assets, and et cetera, um, smart having a Samsung, uh, Samsung phone or a mobile phone, they would love that. Um, but just your, your average layman person, um, those users, I'm, 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 you know, getting them on board or, and or training them to, to use it. Um, would it would be i would say would be a little bit challenging but you know it's it's a great yeah it's a great idea I'm, i was thinking the same thing but i was thinking that we're going to see an entire industry built yeah. on training people how to use exactly. their private keys yep. how to manage the um the the blockchain stores because they're saying in you know that these stores are going to look similar to apple stores yes. um but get, getting people to understand just like people had to understand how to use facebook for example you know mm -hmm. or uh all sorts of other new technology mm -hmm. uh there was a time when people didn't really know how to use a smartphone yep. <laughs> even yep. you know um yep. i i was just you know thinking about my mother and there was a time when she would not put 
deposit a check into the ATM, you know, <laughs> because, you know, the, the ATM would eat her check and then she would have no record that, yeah. that she had, you know, deposited her check. So I do think that there's going to be a, uh, an industry of people that are, um, that are educating others on this and how to use it and how it's safe and and i think there's going to be a lot of ancillary industries that are developed just around this so richard oh i think you froze yeah, yeah i okay. yeah I think froze, froze. yeah yeah i think it's great i think you know just like Um, pe people adapt, you know. Mark. Yeah. You're going in and out, Richard. Me first, and getting into transfer and deposit, what have you, and so. Um, he's in such, but um, very comfortable with that, especially when they want to them it's like I got I gotta learn this this is so beneficial for you know that they have you know the muscle memory and you know kicks in and it just come like the second nature mm -hmm. yeah Tangi is saying here banks in the US are now able to uh, cuss I guess keep custody of crypto Okay, I didn't know that. Banks in the US are now able to keep custody of crypto. Mass adoption is coming. She's working on becoming a blockchain ambassador so she can teach our people. Our participation is low for investing in the stock market and I want to help with crypto and blockchain. Yeah, I think for black people, for the average black person, it is going to be uh, just regular use in barbershop, beauty salon, you know, grocery store, things like that. Uh, unfortunately, we are the last uh, to uh, participate in these things, but, um, you know, definitely connecting with Nadja out in Los Angeles and, and others who are trying to, uh, to lead the way. And I also think it's about us finding use cases that we find relevant, you know, I, I've been saying that in the yeah. past couple of years. So, well, let's go through, oh, looks like I have two more um, articles here. So this is about St uh, Stella Lumens growing strong in Q2 of 2020. So again, this is around the Stellar Development Foundation. They published a quarterly report and last quarter, they had a quarterly report which stated that a major, there was a major, uh, major network expansion. They released the uh, Protocol 13, introduced important new features such as the fee increase, more detailed asset authorization control, and, and multiplex accounts. I can't seem to read today. Um, Stellar has invested in promising projects that use XLM and are helping to spread and increase acceptance. So this is one of the main reasons why I wanted to, to point this out, because they are really looking, again, to penetrate the market. So uh, these include the wallet provider Abra, which has more than 3 million active users worldwide. Stellar has also invested in Satoshi Pay, which provides a platform for instant transaction processing across national borders. So they're trying, of course, to go against Ripple, and we knew that. The SDF has also increased its media impact and in recent weeks has held more than 20 virtual conferences and events and participated in eight additional crypto conferences. Number of transactions carried out in the second quarter rose by 38% and the daily trading volume is up as well. So I wanted to point this out to talk a lot more about strategy here in terms of what they're trying to do. As we can see, they are really going for mass adoption and being um, the place that people consider or the... Um, the top <clears throat> or one of the top uh, protocols that people consider when uh, mass adoption happens. And then the other thing that I 
pointed out here is that they're also doing a lot of marketing and promotion as well. I think in business, one of the things we do is we focus a lot on the technology. And remember Microsoft um, didn't have the best technology. They had the best promotion and distribution strategy. So it seems like Stellar is trying to do the same thing and go, going in Microsoft's, um, following Microsoft's uh, path. So again, just wanted to, uh, to point that out uh, as well, so. You know, Sri, Sri, I want to say one interesting point too, because you mentioned about them uh, looking that they are going to kind of go off the, go against, go capture the same market that Ripple was looking mm -hmm. for. It's funny because, you know, Jed McCaleb, who's a founder of Stellar, was a co-founder of Ripple and he left. So, you know, and I, and I believe that he kind of left because he didn't, you know, believe in the direction that the other mm -hmm. founders were. Ripple was um, going, yeah. Right. So, it's um, possible. Kind of, yes, yes. Um, and we can kind of see that too. We can kind of see where Ripple was at one point, this, you know, okay. shiny coin. That was a talk. And, <laughs> and yeah, it was a talk and it was, a, you know, it was the play to make. And I still own Ripple, so I'm not going to lie. Uh, but um, yeah, I mean, I think that that there is a lot of competition here and it'll be interesting to see who comes out on top, mm -hmm. especially in the fintech space. So. Yeah. I or, or I should say not fintech, I should say um, international payments. Um, yeah. Yeah. Uh, Daniel, you have anything? Yeah, I was just thinking uh, along those lines as well. I mean, the international, that's that's a huge market and Stellar is, is, is looking to to capture it and, and, and kind of control it because that's, that's the international, that's the, that's the huge, huge market. So, um, create competition um, and, and see who wins or who comes out on top. And being, you know, being in that international market gives you that, that chance, actually. Yeah. Well, I mean, blockchain is so international. It's, it's mm -hmm. decentralized. It's naturally international. So whoever's going to win is going to have to do it by uh, dominating the, you know, the global yeah. market, which is why mm -hmm. I think that connecting with Samsung and their global market makes sense. Yeah. So uh, we have someone here who puts a couple of things in the chat. Um, Tangi is saying, I, oh, go ahead, Richard. I'm sorry. Oh, yes, that's the way. But I, I think it's, it's, um, it's amazing what Samsung is doing. And I'm thinking about some stories that I've been hearing, you know, in Africa and how they and how they're paying their utilities and their rent, what have you, via their phones. Mm -hmm. And um, Akon, the recording artist, not only recording artist, but an ambassador. He's building a crypto city in Senegal, his home country on the continent of Africa. It's going to be huge for on an international, from our perspective, on an international yeah. basis. Not only that, for in, in all third world countries, yeah. you know, they make up, um, so much of the, the, the population of the world is, 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 is huge. And I can only imagine when, and well, I shouldn't say it, but when um, Apple does the same thing, I'm, my, I had a thought, if Steve Jobs was around, would he be first? You know, oh, wow. that's a good point. <laughs> yeah. you know? Who knows? Yeah. Who isn't, knows? It, isn't it amazing if I just digress that, um, Steve Jobs, right? He wasn't in the communication business. He wasn't in the phone business, and he just took over. Mm -hmm. yeah. Took over. <laughs> well, he was definitely a visionary, and he was, um, I think he was like one of those once-in-a-lifetime entrepreneurs. Mm -hmm. You know, I don't know if Elon Musk is, is going to live up to that or not, um, but yeah. you know, he, he definitely is that, Steve Jobs was that person that could see 20 years out. So uh, yeah. yeah, but you know yeah. what? Bra bravo to you, Sherry. Mm. You know, right. as in and spearheading black blockchain consultants because yes. out of this group, we're gonna have those. 
to oh, all Well, look, from your lips to God's ears, I, I would love I nothing concur. more than a person saying, I built this multi-trillion dollar, you know, company, and I have to think. <laughs> yeah. Black I'm blockchain consultants, I'd be like, okay. <laughs> yeah. Yeah. We did that, yes. Yeah. So Tanji is saying, I think there will be multiple winners in international payment space, both XLM and XRP will win. My only thought with that is I think that I'm going to go back to um, Apple and Microsoft with the PC and people thought that both could win and Apple went into the schools and Microsoft went into the uh, workplace. Mm -hmm. And Microsoft ended up winning for about three decades. And now you're only seeing where Apple is catching up with their, their MacBooks and things like that. So mm -hmm. I, I kind of personally feel like somebody's going to capture the big financial institutions, your Bank of America's, your HSBC banks, you know, places like that, your, your money grams, mm -hmm. et cetera. And whomever captures a majority of that market, in my opinion, with international payment space is going to win. Mm -hmm. Be because it's, it's all about, like, you have to think about the, the business model of that. And uh, you get paid based on the number of transactions that you do and how much yeah. money you're, you're um, transferring internationally. So, yeah. and I think it'll take a long time for people to pull away <laughs> from those central institutions. I don't think it's going to happen right away. You know, you know what, can, can I just add one point? I, I listened sure. to a talk on Saturday from Andreas Antonopoulos. If anyone, you know, um, you know, follows and listens to Andreas, I, I think he's one of our best thinkers in the blockchain crypto space. And, and, he great, and he really put out a great analogy. He talked about transferring from horse and buggy to automobiles. And he said that they, like when that happened, automobiles had to use the old infrastructure first, before, because they had to, they had to go down dirt roads that were made for horses. Um, mm -hmm. And, you know, and, and he said that it will be, you know, this transition expected to use the same infrastructure that was already there before it then creates its own new infrastructure, which is, you know, paved roads and stoplights and that sort of thing, you know, that's, that's suited for automobiles. So. Right. Um, I thought that was really key too. That's a great analogy. And, and yep. yeah, that goes exactly mm. to what I was talking about. So mm -hmm. um, I, I think that we overestimate what the changes that people are willing to make in a short amount of time, you know, mm -hmm. um, because we're really into it. We think that others will be into it as well or be able to transition as well. And whatever you've seen, whether it's people coming online, you know, you had some people who, who didn't come online for online learning until this COVID thing and their kids had to get online yeah. in order to get their lessons, you know? Um, you have some people in, in certain parts of our country, unfortunately, who still don't have internet and their kids can't, log in and get in. So uh, I think that we, we, um, we overestimate that sometimes, you know, so, well, this is the final article here. This is about Abra and again, Stellar and Abra are working together. So um, this article is just about the fact that the Abra CEO believes that Bitcoin scaling uh, is going to, the blockchain adoption is going to um, require bigger blocks. And he just personally believes that Bitcoin and the Bitcoin protocol is not going to be able to handle it. So uh, again, we're talking about mass adoption here. Gaining mass adoption as a store, as a global store of value, however, obviously requires the ability to handle high traffic. And we can all agree with that. Bar mm -hmm. Heights comments show his confidence in second layer solutions, although he did mention larger blocks for Bitcoin on chain scaling. To scale on chain to billions of people, new technologies will be required as well as dramatically increased block sizes. We can all agree with that. Mm -hmm. So they have over a hundred different crypto assets on their platform. Abra hosts compatibility 
for multiple blockchains. Uh, so this is interoperability here. The digital assets held in Abra's system today are 100% native. They use whatever platform each individual digital asset was built on across a hundred, all hundred or so digital assets um, <clears throat> our Abra app supports. So why are we talking about this? Because Seller Development Foundation gave them $5 million. So again, this is Stellar using its money and its power to get more access and more access and more access. And this is why I was saying this looks like the Microsoft model where Microsoft basically gave away their, um, oops, gave away their, um, their product mm -hmm. and got everybody hooked on it like crack. And now it's like, I need my Word, I need my Excel, you know, I, we don't know uh, of, of any other um, solutions that are out there. So, you know, I'm just throwing that out. So, yeah. Yeah. So, it, it, you know, it's all about scaling and, and, and Stella is seeing that, you know, scaling, they understand that you got to, um, to, you know, to scale and to have, you know, billions of transactions going. So you really, you got to have that scale and they know that's where it's going. Um, mm -hmm. You got to build a bigger block, you know, block size for that um, mm -hmm. to have the seamless transaction. Um, again, we're talking about, you know, globally, right? In the, in the international. So um, they understand that scaling is key and that's something when the early stages of the, the blockchain technology uh, creation scaling was, you know, was a challenge, and and still is to to you know to some extent. So, I think we've talked about scaling, we've talked about security, yep. and we've talked about um, accessing the private keys. If you're if you're going to have individuals responsible for their keys, and yep. I think all three of those are equally as important yeah. uh, to uh, get a handle on before mass adoption can occur. Yeah. So Eric, Richard, thoughts? No, I, I was just going to agree with everything that Daniel just said. It, it's all about scaling. Um, and, and, and this is also too one reason to be really honest, why I'm not a Bitcoin maximalist. I'm a strong, passionate believer in Bitcoin, but also I do see um, the use cases for, for you know, other altcoins. I, I just do. Um, you know, so uh, I, I know if there's any maximalists out there, don't come attacking me. I'm sorry. I, I do. At <laughs> Eric's fence. At Eric's I know they are. They're vicious. <laughs> yeah. Yeah. I just do. I just think that like we're going to have all coins. We're going to have other use cases um, mm -hmm. that will require uh, specialized blockchains to handle uh, specific problems and that sort of thing. And uh, just makes sense. So. Yeah. Richard? Yes. Yeah. I, I think of it like this. I had a thought when, you know, Microsoft and Apple were competing in the in the early in the early days and and the amount of memory that they have, you know, whether it's two fifty six and then it goes up to a gigabyte and so on and mm -hmm. so forth. I always believe that they always had the amount of um space, maybe like two two versions ahead they already had it but they're not going to put it out yet you know just like with um um you know um mining for coins right now they they upgraded i think it's imf they they bought new machines uh, he was making a good point too yeah 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 i can't remember the company is number right now but they just Just that, that they're already working on it or that it's coming up in four years. So they're already scaling up. They already have that. So it'll just, you know, it's a moneymaker for them. You know, yeah. just like the versions of, of um, you know, ISO or Microsoft, you know, they already have, you know, when it's 10, they already have 11 and 12 already in the back. That's true. Yeah. Yeah. So I know we're yeah. supposed to be getting um, back to our book club too, the real business of blockchain. So I'm sorry, Richard, you're going in and out, but we, we, we heard uh, the majority of what you said. 
Um, so I think I think a part of what you're saying is right, and and getting back to okay. the book club, the real business of blockchain, and and mm -hmm. delving into that more so that um, we can be ready, yeah, you know, absolutely. as blockchain consultants when this whole thing happens. So. Absolutely. Uh, Victoria is saying the major financial institutions are all also actively building their own blockchain solutions in house because the tech is still new to the vast majority of consumers. They don't necessarily need to have the best tech, just seamless integration into existing services and products. Mm -hmm. uh, so yeah, that that is possible. They don't need to have the best tech. You're right. They do need to have something that's functional because customer service is. Um, I mean, it's so important, you know. Yeah. Um, and again, and um, I was just thinking about the book, you know, and, and the, the book that we that we uh, study through in our in our um, in the circle you know, in the book club. Mm -hmm. it, that still has a. You, we got to really understand, even though you know, from the outside perspective, is we say in decentralization, but it still has a centralization element to it because that's mm -hmm. the banks are still controlling it. Right, mm -hmm. they still yeah. they still have that um, that centralized element to it. However, like they like uh, Victoria is saying, that seamless integration, meaning internally within one another, Bank of America against Chase, uh, that barrier of systems is was blockchain from that perspective. Is, has broken down those walls. That's decentralization and that is permissionless because now, uh, you know, Bank of America, Chase, or any other bank, they can, the blockchain network provides that seamless integration now because these barriers of different systems between one another is broken down. So now we can able to, you know, transact amongst one another and you know, do transactions in real time, no matter which system that Chase is on or which system that Bank of America. That's right. Good point. That's right. Yeah. Yeah. I mean, definitely. Well, that is the end of blockchain chat for the evening. I hope Thank everyone you. enjoyed our discussion. Uh, I guess we did a little bit of a futurist discussion tonight about, um, about this topic and you know, I want to thank Richard and Daniel for coming on and keeping Eric and I company this evening. I want to thank everyone who uh, was in the chat and participating. And don't forget about the $20 Bitcoin challenge. Get your LinkedIn stuff together. You have until next Friday in order to do that. So God bless everyone. Have a great evening. All right. Have a good night. Good night.